Hi, I'm Matt Bierner. I'm an engineer on VS Code, and in this video, we're going to be covering some tips and tricks for working productively with VS Code. Now, this is going to include a little bit of everything. There'll be some tips that are more appropriate for beginners who are just getting started with VS Code, and some that are more appropriate for advanced users who really want to optimize their editing experience. I'm going to be listing off some of my personal favorite tips and tricks, but there'll be a focus on things that have been introduced within the last year or so, so more recent tips and tricks and things that you might not be aware of unless you're really scanning the release notes. Now, before we begin, just a little bit about me. Um, I, as I said, I work on VS Code. I maintain VS Code's JavaScript and TypeScript support, along with things like the built-in Markdown extension and some of the APIs as well, so the WebView API, Code Actions, um, that type of thing. It's been really interesting to watch VS Code evolve over these past couple of years. Now, for 2020, I've been posting daily tips and tricks on Twitter and YouTube, um, and it's been really cool to see the response there. Um, and some of these tips and tricks will draw from some of the most popular posts I've made. I'll also include some links if you want to follow along and get those daily tips and tricks that are coming in because those go into some really more interesting topics. They cover things like settings, extensions that I just can't fit into this video. So in this video, we're only going to be looking at the top 20 or so uh, tips and tricks and things that you might not be familiar with, but I think will really make a big impact on your workflow. So without further ado, here's uh, 20 tips and tricks for working productively with VS Code. Let's start off with one fairly recent addition to VS Code, the timeline view. Now, when you open a Git repository in VS Code, the timeline view shows your commit history. It's just over here in the Explorer, and if you're not seeing it, it might be minimized. So make sure the timeline view is maximized here, and then make sure you've opened a Git repository as well. Now, within this timeline view, I can browse through the list of commits. And if I make this a little wider here, you can see who made these commits, the commit title, and then when this commit was made. I can just scroll through the history, load some older ones if I wanted to as well. And then I can hover over one of these commits to see the full commit message and some additional details about this commit. Now, if I click on one of these commits, I will actually see the changes that were made in this file for this current commit. So I'm seeing here's the changes that were made within this file. And if I close this, I can go and open some other changes, for example, see some more extensive changes, and just navigate through those changes one at a time. By default, the timeline view actually follows the current file that you're in. So let's open this language test file. And you'll see the timeline view is updating, and now it's showing the commits for the current language test file instead. And if I click on one of these, we'll again see the differences there. If I want to change that behavior, and let's say I go back to editor group, and I want to have the timeline view just show the history for this editor group file, I can go in here and click this little pin icon. And when I do this, and now I switch to another file, the timeline view is not updated. So I've currently pinned the timeline to just that one file. And I can, again, navigate and interact with that as normal. So that's the timeline view, a fairly recent introduction to VS Code. Now, following up on the timeline view, let's look at multi-cursor. This is a feature that VS Code has actually supported for quite a long time, and it lets you create multiple cursors in the file so you can edit the file at multiple locations. You can do some really creative text transformations using this. There's a few different ways you can create multiple cursors, and let's take a look at a few of those. So let's go in here and say that I wanted to convert all of the const here to instead use let in this uh, TypeScript file. So I'm just going to select some text to start. I'm going to select const here. And now I'm going to press Control D on Windows or Command D on Mac. And I'm going to say Control D there. And now I've created a second cursor on the second match of const here. So whenever you press Control D, for whatever text you have selected, it will create a new cursor for the next instance of that text. If I do that one more time, now I've created three cursors. And I have all three cursors here. I can use my arrow keys to just move throughout the code here. I can even start editing and now convert all of those to let. So that was a quick way to make that change. Now let's just undo that real quick. And say that I go in here and I'm using Control D again. And I press Control D one too many times. And oh no, I've gone to somewhere where I don't actually want to edit. There's actually a way to undo that cursor change using the cursor undo command. So I'm going to open up the command palette and just use Control Shift P or Command Shift P on Mac and do cursor undo. And this is bound to Control U by default. And when I do this, it will actually undo the last cursor change that I made. So it undo it undoes adding that extra cursor. And now I just have my three cursors again, and I can go and make the change. So that's one way you can actually create multiple cursors. Now, there's some other ways in cases like this where you have sequential lines that you want to edit that you can actually create multiple cursors without having any sort of selection or anything. So I'm just going to put my cursor on the first line of this. And now I'm going to hold down 
uh, Control, Shift, and Alt, and use the arrow keys and press arrow down. And this would be um, Option, Command, and arrow keys on Mac. And now I can go and I press the arrow keys. I'm creating multiple cursors. So down arrow creates a cursor below the current location. Up arrow would create a cursor above the current location. And I can do the same effect here. So now I have three cursors. Just go in and convert that to let if I wanted to. So that's a few ways you can create multi-cursors. And then one final one, if you're wanting to edit a, a lot of different things in the file, I'm going to go make another selection here. And let's say I wanted to change all the instances of the const keyword in this TypeScript file, uh, followed by a space, to instead say let and then space. Now, I could use find replace for that, but sometimes that's a little bit clunky. And if you're doing more complex text transformations, you might have to write a really complicated regular expression. Multi-cursors are often a more efficient way and a more kind of fun way to actually make those changes. So let's go and actually select all the instances of const in the file. To do that, I don't have to go and just mash Control D until I've selected everything. I can actually open the command palette again with Control Shift P, and then say select all occurrences of find match, which is bound to Control Shift L by default. And when I run this, now you can see that I've created cursors here. But if I scroll down in the file, I've also created cursors for every match in this entire file. You can see these cursors being highlighted over in the little gutter over here. Um, so if I start typing, let's just say let space. I've now edited every place in the file to instead use let. So once you start getting familiar with multi-cursors, you can do some really powerful text transformations. As I said, they're often a good alternative to using find replace, and they're a really efficient way of manipulating text in VS Code. So as you're likely already familiar with, VS Code is very heavy on using keyboard shortcuts to uh, efficiently navigate through your code. So let's say that I wanted to jump to a specific file. Rather than actually going into the Explorer and searching for that file and having to remember the file path, if I know the file name, I can just open the command palette. So I'm going to press Control P for the Go To File view. And then I can type in that file name, say refactor, and then just quickly jump to that file by pressing Enter. So now I've jumped over into this file without having to remember where this file is located within my project. So pretty cool. But there are some other ways that you can actually navigate through um, a file once you have it open. So this is a fairly lengthy file. And if I actually wanted to navigate to a specific part of this file, rather than scanning through it, one way to do that and, and quickly jump to part of this file is using the go to symbol command. So I'm going to press Control Shift O. That would be Command Shift O on Mac. So I'm going to say Control Shift O. And when I do this, in the uh, command palette here, VS Code is now displaying a list of symbols for the current file. I can browse through these symbols and see all the classes, methods, functions, variables, those type of things. And if I want to actually jump to one of these, I can just start typing to filter down this list. So I'm going to say provider. And there are two symbols that have provider in the name here. And I'm going to move between them. So as I move between them, you can see VS Code is highlighting the class in this case, or the function, or the method in this case. And I just I, let's go to jump to this one. So I'm going to press Enter here. And now my cursor has been placed on the class TypeScript Refactor Provider. So I didn't have to scroll through the file. All I had to do was, again, press Command Shift O, and then type the symbol that I wanted to jump to, and then start navigating through there. So VS Code supports this for um, languages like JavaScript um, and TypeScript out of the box. But it also supports it for uh, Markdown, for example. So let's go and open a Markdown file. Uh, so let's do readme.md. And in this Markdown file, if I then open the uh, go to symbol view using Control Shift O, you can see a list of all the headers in this file. So there are eight headers in this file. I can again start uh, filtering these by typing. So let's see, develop. But if I want to go to one of these, all I have to do is just browse to it and it's being highlighted. And then I can press Enter and my cursor is immediately jumped to that header. Now, other languages can also be supported by GoToSymbol just by installing extensions. So if you want support for Python or Java or C Sharp, just install the um, Python, Java, and C Sharp extensions, and then you'd be able to use GoToSymbol in those files as well. But this is a quick way to navigate your, through your files without having to scroll and search through your code manually. Another area that we've been focusing on recently is making it even easier to debug JavaScript and TypeScript inside of VS Code. So here I have a simple node program. And what this program is doing is there's a master process that is going to be run in this block that then spawns some child processes that run this block. So those child processes uh, create HTTP servers to handle requests there. 
let's say that we wanted to debug this program. I'm just going to go create a breakpoint right here. And if I want to debug this now, I don't have to configure anything. I'm just going to open up the command palette. So Control Shift P, Command Shift P on Mac, and say debug, create JavaScript debug terminal. And I'm going to run this command. Now, when I run this, you'll see that a new terminal is opened up. And it's just like my standard terminal. It's using PowerShell and everything. But the difference about this terminal, what is special about it, is that if you start a node program from it, VS Code will automatically attach to it. So let's test this out. Let's go and start node cluster.js and see what happens. So we ran that in the terminal. We didn't have to do any special configuration. And sure enough, VS Code has just automatically uh, hit the breakpoint that we had um, in this uh, file here. So very easy, no configuration required to start debugging. Now let's take a look at some of the other improvements we've done to debugging. And we can just start stepping over this code and go to the micromatch function here. And let's actually go step into the implementation of this. And you can see here that the implementation of this function, this code has been minimized. So basically, we have a single line that has all of the code for it. And we can't really debug this line at all. It's really difficult to understand what is even going on here. But VS Code has actually detected that we are working with minified code and is offering to pretty print that. So let's go and say, would we like to pretty print this? Yes. And now, sure enough, VS Code has um, formatted this code. So it is a lot easier to see what is going on. And it is also a lot easier to debug. Now, this has not actually changed the format of the code on disk, but it has um, minified the code that we are debugging. So we can just step through things as normal here and explore things much easier in this pretty printed code. I'm going to step out of this again. And now we're back in our main program. Now, as I mentioned, what this program is actually doing is there is a master process that is now going to spawn a number of child processes. So it's going to fork off other node child processes here. And if we continue on, so I'm just going to say continue here. If we want to attach to one of those child processes, what VS Code does behind the scenes is that it is automatically attached to those for us. So we don't have to configure anything specially. It, it sees that a child process has been forked off, and it is automatically attached to that. So let's go down to the child process code. And I'm going to create a breakpoint inside the server for one of the child processes. And now I'm just going to go visit one of these servers by going to, in the debug terminal here, going to the uh, local link for it and control clicking on that. Now we open up our browser. And it's going to the server that we just set up there. And sure enough, behind the scenes, VS Code is gone and automatically attached to the child process and now hit the breakpoint there. So again, no configuration required for any of this. We're able to debug our node program and then debug all the child processes with it as well. I'm just going to stop debugging this program here. So exit out of this. And now let's go and look at how you can debug some client-side code. So this would be JavaScript that is running on a web page. Let's open up main.js here. And here we have some client-side JavaScript code. And this code is going to be served up from this index.html file by a simple um, static HTTP server or HTML server. So let's go and actually start this. I'm going to go and run in my debug terminal again. I'm going to say npm run server and start up the server here. It's starting the server behind the scenes. And now it prints out the location of the server. Um, so here's the local port of the server. I'm again in the debug terminal going to control click on this link and open up the page for our server. So our application here is very simple. It just adds two numbers together. We can put in three here. And then sure enough, three plus two is equal to five. Now let's say we wanted to de uh, debug this code. So I'm just going to go back to main.js here. And I'm going to put a breakpoint inside of the first onChange function here. And I'm going to go back to my web page and actually go and update the value of this. So let's say five. And now go and change the value. Now, if we go back to VS Code, you can see that we've actually hit the breakpoint. So VS Code automatically attached to the client-side JavaScript that was running in our browser. And we've now hit the breakpoint. We can go and inspect all the values here. So we have second value, all these different things. So um, pretty easy. We didn't have to configure anything in this case either. Now, another really cool thing is look at what this code is doing. So um, in this example, it's actually using a worker to a web worker to go and add up these two numbers, which is a bit of overkill for a web worker. But here we're posting a message to the web worker uh, for, of the values to add up. Now, if we actually hit step into, let's go see. What VS Code does is it now steps into the web worker itself. So here we are inside of the web worker where it was handling the post message. We can see the data that the message was getting and everything here. And now we can step over this. So we're just automatically debugging that web worker, which is pretty much just like a separate process, but on the web. And then we can go and step out of this. So the web worker is now going to post the result back. And I'm going to go step into this. And sure enough, we have stepped back into our main client-side code. So we could just transparently step between the web worker 
um, and our client code um, using the debugger. So those are just a few of the changes that we've been making to VS Code recently to make debugging even easier, but they enable some really cool scenarios. There's also support for things like profiling. Um, and if you're interested in this, definitely check out the VS Code docs because they highlight some of the other additions to debugging. Now we saw the timeline view that can show you the git commit history of the current file. But if you're using GitHub for hosting your source code, the GitHub pull request extension actually lets you work with pull requests directly in VS Code. Let's go over to the extensions view, and I'm going to type in GitHub pull requests. And I want the GitHub pull request and issues extension here. I've already installed this extension, but I've just disabled it now. Um, so I'm going to go enable this. And I've already signed into GitHub. When you first install this ex extension, it would prompt you to sign into GitHub, and you just need to authorize it so it can go and connect to GitHub. Now, what this extension lets you do, though, is actually view the pull requests um, and actually interact with them directly within VS Code. So here I have a new entry in my uh, status bar or my activity bar over here for GitHub. And if I click on this, I'm in a repository that is hosted on GitHub. You can see all of the pull requests and issues that are assigned to my current account. Let's go and expand the assigned to me pull requests here. It's going and fetching uh, things here. And I can then see a list of the pull requests. And then I can expand my current pull request, and I can see the changes within that pull request, as well as the pull request overview. So let's click on the pull request overview, and I can see pretty much like GitHub with the comments and everything. So I have all this, the same information as the pull request pretty much, and I can do a bunch of things, merge it, all these operations here. But the cool thing that I can do in VS Code is I can actually go and check out this pull request. So let's go check out the pull request. And you'll see down here it's saying switching to review mode. And right now, it is checking out that pull request to a local branch. And let's say no to that. So it's created a new local branch, and it is updating everything so that I can go and review this pull request. So I'll give it a moment here. All right, and so now it's checked everything out, and I can see I have a new entry in the GitHub view, which is the changes in this pull request. I'm just going to expand this. And now I can go to the specific changes that have happened. So I have my current version of, or my current code is matching what is in that pull request. I didn't have to go and run a bunch of complicated git commands. I could just uh, click on that button. And if I go and open one of the files, I can go in here and see all the changes that were made. Now I can also leave comments within the file, just like you can on GitHub as well. So I'm browsing around and I say, oh, this looks pretty good. But I'm going to go over here. And in this white little bar on this side, I'm going to go and create a comment. So I'm going to say to do test. And I get markdown IntelliSense and other things there as well. So I can do like bold. And let's go and actually just add a comment directly. So I've added a comment. Other people that are using the GitHub pull request extension or that are viewing this on GitHub would then be able to see my comments. So I'm able to comment in here. I'm able to view the changes. And let's say I look at everything and it looks pretty good. I'm going to go and say exit review mode. So now it's going to go back to my master branch. And once that is done, I could go in and I could actually merge this pull request. So I can have my entire issue workflow, pull request, issue, issue tracking, all those things happening directly within VS Code um, using the GitHub pull request extension. Pretty cool. While navigating through your project, you may already be familiar with VS Code's go to definition command. So just as a refresher, here in this TypeScript file, you can see that the variable actions here is being defined on this line. If I put my cursor on another use of actions, such as down here, VS Code will actually highlight all of the places that actions is being used. And I can also see that over in the gutter here. But if I go and I right click on one of these uses and I say, go to definition, it'll jump to the definition line here. Now I can also use this to jump to the definition of a type in the TypeScript file here. So I'm going to say, right click also bound to F12, and say, go to definition. And it goes and it jumps to the interface for code action set. So that's the go to definition command. And I'm just going to run go back here to jump to my previous location, go back to that code. Now, there's a comparable or a companion command called go to type definition that's also very useful when working in TypeScript, for example. So we saw what go to definition did before. Let's put our cursor back on actions down here. And we know that actions is a code action set. 
And if we hover over that, we can see that information as well. Let's say that we wanted to jump directly to code action set here and see what that interface is all about. I'm just going to right click on it again and say, go to type definition. And this will go and jump to the definition of code action set. So for uh, JavaScript and TypeScript files, it will jump from the variable to the type of the variable itself in, instead of to where that variable is being defined. This can be super useful though, because oftentimes you actually don't care as much about where the variable is being defined as the variable interface methods and other things on there that you want to interact with. Now, go to type definition can also be enabled for other languages like Java and C Sharp just by installing those extensions. But overall, the go to type definition command is a very useful way for navigating through your project. Now, let's take a look at another recent addition to VS Code the ability to move various views about between the sidebar over here and the panel. So I have my sidebar, and you can see that I'm in the Explorer currently. I have a VS Code section, which is my current folder. So this is the Explorer, the Outline section, and then the Timeline section. And then I can switch to other views over in the Activity Bar. So there's Search, for example. And then down in the panel, I have things like the Terminal, Debug Console, Problems, all those type of things. Now I can actually now move things back and forth between these two. So let's go and say, let's say I wanted the search results to show below my code, and I want the search results to display in the panel down here. I can just start, click on the activity bar and start dragging the search icon. And if I go down to the panel here, I get a little indicator of where I can drop this. And let's say I want it to be the first entry in the list. I have now moved my search results down into the panel. So I can do a search as normal, so code action. And I get find, replace, all of the functionality that I want. So I can expand, find, replace, include, exclude filters, for example, all available within the panel here. Now, you can also go in the reverse direction. So I can take the terminal here. Let's just take the terminal, start dragging on this, and I can move it over into the sidebar. So let's go put this as the last entry in the sidebar here. And now I get my full terminal over here in the sidebar. And just to demonstrate that it is working, there's a, running a simple PowerShell command in the sidebar. So pretty cool. Now, you can also be more fine-grained in what you're moving. So let's go back to the Explorer here and say that I wanted to have the outline view visible uh, in the panel, but I wanted it to be visible next to the search results, for example. So I'm using those functionalities together. Um, I can just take this one outline view. So I've clicked and dragged on the outline header. I'm going to drag it down into the panel. And you can see I can drag it into two locations either on the left side or on the right side. And I'm going to go onto the uh, left side here. When I do this, now the outline is down in this panel. It is collapsed at the moment, so I'm going to go expand the outline. Once I do this, you can see that I have my full outline view down here in the search results tab. So that's pretty cool. And, I, and my search results, of course, still function here as well. So I get all my search results and things going on here. If I don't like having the outline view here, of course, I can always just go and drag it back. And now it's back in the Explorer. So I really have the freedom now to move individual views or entire view groups between the Explorer or between the sidebar and the panel. Now, not every view supports this at the moment, but as time goes on, we'll hope that more views will support this and more third party extensions that contribute views will also support that. So that's how you can move views around in VS Code. You can launch VS Code from the command line and open specific folders in it. Here I have a command line, and let's say I wanted to open a different project. So I currently have VS Code running, but I'm just going to use the built-in VS Code terminal and run code-insiders, because I'm using the insiders build of VS Code. If I was on the normal build of VS Code, i just run code on its own. And then I'm going to give it a path to a folder that I want to open. So example, TS React app here. And when I do this, you'll notice that a new window has now started up. and I have loaded a second instance of VS Code with this folder. Now, let's say that I just wanted to switch folders. I didn't actually want to um, open a new window of VS Code. I just wanted to switch my current window to that folder. I'm going to run the same command, but now I'm going to use the dash "-r flag." So I have code insiders dash "-r", and then the folder I want to open. And this will reuse my existing window instead of opening a new one. So I'm going to run this again. And now it's opening. And sure enough, it's opened the TS React app in a new window. Now I'm going to open up the terminal again. And there's a few other useful options. So one is the dash a flag. So I'm going to do code insiders dash a. 
And what dash A does is actually add a folder to your current workspace. So this is enabling multi-root workspaces. So you can have multiple folders open at the same time. And in this case, I'm going to go and let's go add the VS Code project to uh, this current workspace. So I'm just going to do Code Insiders again, dash A, and then the folder I want to add. And as soon as I do this, you'll see that I now have two folders open in my workspace. I have both the example TS React app along with the VS Code folder here. So I've created a new multi-root workspace. Of course, if you're wanting to find more information about some of these command line options, you can always just do Code Insiders dash help. So as you can see, there are a bunch of different command line options available. You can open diffs. You can go to specific lines. Um, all these options here, you can even install extensions if you wanted to directly from the command line. But the dash R flag is one I find especially helpful if you are running this command in the VS Code integrated terminal, because it lets you just reuse that existing window and switch to a new window directly from the command line. Search editors let you view search results in a full width editor. This can provide more context and also can be a more convenient way to work with your search results. Let's go demonstrate this by first opening a normal search. So I'm going to go to the search view, and I'm going to search for app here. And you can see that my search results are displayed in this list here. And it's saying the file name and then all the search results. Now, as I glance through this list, it's a little bit hard to understand the context of all these results. I only see the current line. And if I want more context, I have to click on this line and go to it that way. And it's also um, a little bit cramped feeling. So if I have a lot of results, for example, the sidebar can feel a little bit cramped. And that's where search editors come in. So let's go open a search editor just by clicking on this Open an Editor button below my search input box. And now you can see that VS Code is displaying those same search results over in a full width editor. So this is a normal editor. I can switch back to my apptx file here, and I can go to my search results again. I can drag this around. I can put it to the side of my other editor. So I can do all sorts of things just like a normal editor. And I'm now viewing my search results. It is listing out the file that the search result was found in for app in this case, and then the line number where that search result was found in each of these cases. And I have my full search controls um, as well. So I can do things like regular expression cases, or searches, uh, word searches, and I can even do files to include, exclude, all these different search results in here. So let's go and now modify one of these search things here. So let's say I wanted to only find the word React app. I can just type in the top there, and now I've updated my search results using that. So I, this is a, a live view of my search results. Now, let's say that this uh, I wanted a bit more context on each of these search results. Just right now, I'm seeing only a single line with my one search result in it. If I want more context, I'm going to click on this little list icon over here. And now I can go and use this these arrows to increase the amount of context around my search results. So these are the number of lines that are displayed around my current search result. And if I let's go take this up to like five, for example, now you can see that around each search result, uh, we have four different lines that are being added. So we have more context for each of these results. And it's providing some more information as we're scanning through this list. But the result or the match term itself is still being highlighted in orange here. So we still get that highlighting to help us identify that. And the match line is also made more bold over here. Now, another cool thing about search editors, though, is that you can actually save the um, search editor. So I'm just going to close that. And now I'm going to do uh, save. So just Control S. And I'm going to save my search editor. I'm going to say app search. And now I've gone and saved my current search editor. And if I close this, I can now go into my Explorer and I see my saved file here. If I then click on the search result, I get my same search results back. Now, the search results themselves are recomputed when I open this file. But the search term and all the uh, settings that I have for the search term, those have been saved to the disk. This can be really helpful if you're refactoring code, for example, or uh, tracking to do's or something else. You can save a search into your code base check that in, and then everybody on the team can look at that search very easily and just go through the code base and, and go through those search results and make changes. Now, just as a bonus tip, there's one other cool extension that builds on top of search editors. So I'm going to go to the extensions view and type search editor apply. And I want the search editor apply changes extension. So I'm going to go install this. And once this is installed, let's go back to our search editor again. So go to my search editor, and let's find React app here. And let's go into this file, and I'm going to start editing some of these changes. So I'm going to go use my multi-cursor support and use select all occurrences of find match. I'm just going to say React app 
two. So I've edited all the occurrences here. And now I can actually use this extension. So I'm going to open the command palette again, Control Shift P, and use the apply search editor changes to workspace. And when I do this, it will actually look at my search results and the changes that I've made and apply all of those changes into the file. So I've edited these files live. So I go do that. I, you can see it, oh, it's opened a bunch of changes here. I'm just going to do a file, save all, because I've saved all these changes now. And if I actually open the changes here in my uh, Git view, you can see that it has updated all of the places uh, where I was referencing uh, React App to React App 2. So that's pretty neat. You can use search results to actually modify your code base. And it's especially helpful if you're working with multi-cursor. So that's been a quick look at search editors. Now, you likely already know that if you hover over a variable in VS Code, you will see the type information and any associated documentation with that variable. So here I'm hovering over is preferred. I can see that the type is Boolean or undefined for this property. And then here is the documentation for this property, which is just in this case, it's a TypeScript file. So this documentation is coming from a JS doc comment. Now, if I want to hover over something else here, such as the apply refactoring command class, if I hover over that, you can see that the hover is not very helpful in this case, because it's saying, well, this is a class ID, which we kind of already know, and there's no associated documentation with it either. So not the most helpful hover. However, if I then press control while hovering, so I'm going to hold down control here, you can actually see a preview of the class itself. So here we're seeing the first couple of lines of the class, which is providing a little bit more context on what is going on here. Um, and I can see the preview of this class. If I continue holding down control and I click in this case, I actually navigate to that class definition itself. So you can see my cursor has jumped to this cl class definition, and now I can browse through this class itself. Now, this can be very helpful for functions, for example. So I'm going to go look at this to file range request args function, and I see the signature here when I just hover over it normally. I'm going to hold down control, and you can see that the um, the function name has a blue underline under it now, indicating it is turned into a link. And now I also see a preview of the implementation. And in this case, it can show us the entire implementation of that function. So we see here is the entire signature of the function. It is just a simple arrow function. Now, if I click again, I'll just quickly navigate to the uh, function itself there. So kind of a quick way to navigate through your code. You can explore it um, either by first opening up a preview by pressing Control while hovering, or uh, holding down control and then clicking to actually navigate to the full definition of a symbol. VS Code includes a built-in markdown preview that lets you see a rendered version of your markdown files. Here I just have the markdown page from the VS Code docs here, and I'm going to open the markdown preview to the side of this document by using either control K and then pressing V, or I can click on this little preview icon in the uh, bar up here. So when I do this, you can see I've opened up a preview, and let's go hide the sidebar so I have more space. And I have a preview of my current Markdown file. Now, as I start scrolling through this preview, you'll see that things like images are being rendered. All the styling is being rendered here. And you'll also notice that it, the scrolling is synchronized with my text. So as I scroll through, it is trying to match the top of the two viewports together so that the scrolling is synchronized. If I go back to my text here and I start scrolling, it is also synchronized that way. So I can scroll through either one, and the scrolling should be synchronized. I get this nice preview of everything going on here. Now, you can also open a markdown preview instead of being to the side of the current file um, in place of the current file, just by uh, doing, I'm going to open my command palette using Control Shift P, and then saying markdown open preview. And this will open the preview in the same group as the current editor. So now I've opened a, a preview here. And it's in the same editor group I was in before. There are also a few ways you can extend the Markdown Preview. So by default, VS Code's Markdown Preview uses some styling that's fairly generic. But if we wanted to, we can actually make the styling. Uh, we can customize the styling so we can load our own CSS using settings. Um, but we can also install extensions that do this. I'm going to open the extensions view here. And I'm going to search GitHub Markdown. And we want the GitHub Markdown Preview styling here. Um, or actually, let's go to this one, the GitHub Markdown Preview, because this includes both the styling and then some other functionality as well to make the preview more closely match GitHub. So let's go install the GitHub Markdown Preview extension. And it installs all of that. And now when I go back to my preview, you can see it has a white background and sort of a styling that is more closely resembling GitHub. 
And then we've also gained support for emojis and other things. So if you wanted to do an emoji here, for example, I've gone and added a cat emoji, um, which is not normally smart, supported in VS Code's default markdown preview. So extensions can extend the markdown preview. You get things like scroll synchronization. Um, and there's just a lot of flexibility in being able to preview your files directly within VS Code. Now, I know we're moving pretty quickly here, but I'm trying to squeeze in as many tips and tricks as possible. Hopefully, you've been finding some of these useful. And if you've been confused about any of these or want to learn more about them, just visit the VS Code website and the docs that are available there, because they really expand on a lot of the things that I've covered. But let's move on to the next tip, which is the call hierarchy. So the call hierarchy lets you view what other functions are calling a given function in your code base and what functions that function is itself calling, which a lot of functions going on there. But actually, let's take a look at how this works in a TypeScript file. So VS Code supports call hierarchy out of the box for TypeScript and JavaScript. And then you can install an extension like the Java extension to get call hierarchy support in Java files if you want that. So to trigger call hierarchy, I'm going to go to the function that I want to uh, target, and I'm going to right click on it and say, show call hierarchy. Now it opens a new view to the side here. And in this case, it is showing all the incoming calls to my current function. So these are all the other functions that are calling get code actions somewhere in their implementation. We can tell these are the incoming calls because over here, there's a little phone with a arrow going into it. So this is the incoming calls. And if we want to see where get call or where get code actions is being called within these, I can just go to, let's go click on update here. And we go navigate to the update method. And then if we scroll down a little bit, we can actually see get code actions is being called right here. So it's highlighting the occurrence of get code actions. Now we can also navigate through the rest of the list. See this other get code actions is calling our get code actions here. So we can see all the places where our get code actions is being called. Now, if we want to flip this around and see who is the who is uh, get code actions here itself calling, we can just click on this little arrow up here. And when we do this, we'll instead see all of the outgoing calls from this function. Um, so this is, if we look at the body, you can see it has a fairly long implementation here. And this is a list of all the other functions that the get code actions method is calling somewhere. We can just also navigate through these. So let's go to disposable store, for example. And we can just navigate through this entire list. Now let's flip this around again. So we will again have the incoming calls. And let's say that we are interested in one of the entries here. So let's we'll go to this get code actions call. I can expand this and see all of the incoming calls uh, for the get code actions uh, method here. So if I expand the, the um, entry in this list, I can see who is calling this get code actions function. And I can see, oh, it's being called by render marker status bar. And I can even change the call hierarchy scope to instead be scoped on this entry just by clicking on this little phone icon over here. So now I've redone a, a new search for this other get code actions method. I can then, of course, flip it around and say out, see the outgoing calls of get code actions here. And I can just navigate through the entire um, get code actions uh, or through my entire call hierarchy of my files just by using this. So I can expand things. I can see who is calling a given function, who that function is being called by, and just really explore my code base using the call hierarchy. Many of VS Code's views, such as the Explorer and the Timeline, support filtering just by typing. Say that I wanted to find all files in the Explorer here that had the word code in their title. I'm just going to focus on the Explorer and then type out code. And you can see that it has started a search by this little orange box up here. And then in the Explorer itself, it is now highlighting all files that have um, a, the word code in them and is highlighting the match there. So we can go down to code, to code Lens, for example, and we can see all the matched files. Now, in this mode, it is not actually uh, filtering the list. So all the normal file entries are still being displayed. Um, and we can actually change that by going up to the search icon here, so or to the search term here. And you can see that at the moment, it is only highlighting the terms. If I change this icon, so I go to filter on type and turn that on, the Explorer will now only show the files that match my search term. So we can only we are now only seeing files and folders that have the word code in the title in the Explorer here. So based on what you're, you're looking for and what your needs are, you may prefer one search mode or the other, either highlighting or actually filtering down the list. Now, if you're done with this, you can actually just press Escape or hover over the search term again and press the little X icon to stop the filtering. So I'm going to just press Escape. Now I've stopped the filtering. 
This also works in the timeline view. So let's go to the timeline view. I'm going to focus on this entry and I'm going to then type code again. And you can see that it is now highlighting all of the um, occurrences of code in the titles for these pull requests um, or in, of, of these commits. If I go and I hover and I change it to instead filter on type, now it is only showing the uh, commits that have the word code somewhere in their title. So I can filter or just highlight things just by typing here and again, press escape to stop that. So that's VS Code's filter on type functionality. It's also enabled in many of the debug views, for example, and it's really useful when dealing with long lists of items. Check.js lets you use the power of TypeScript to type check your normal JavaScript code. This also enables some useful quick fixes. Here I have a project created using Create React App, and by default, VS Code will only report uh, syntax errors in the file. So let's say I go in here, forget the closing paren, VS Code will report errors for that, but it will not report errors for misspellings or undefined variables and that type of thing. If we want that, we actually have to enable Check.js. So there are a few different ways to enable Check.js in, um, in a project. One of them is to enable it on a per file level. So I'm going to go up to the top of this file. And if I want to enable Check.js just in this one file, I can add a, a comment that says TS Check. And when I do this, you'll notice that a bunch of errors are now showing up in the file that were not visible before. We can hover over these errors and see that, oh, we probably meant to use class name here, for example. So I'm going to trigger IntelliSense, change this to class name. Now, the second error is a little bit more interesting. And we have a function called add here. You can see that add is picking up its types. If we hover over the signature, it is picking up the types uh, for x and y from the js.comment here. Um, and TypeScript is using those types to perform type checking. If we hover over the error here, we can see that, oh, we're passing in an unexpected type here. So we are passing in a type of a function that returns a number instead of a number itself. And TypeScript is suggesting that we actually probably meant to call this expression, which in this case seems like the right thing. So we can go and quickly fix that. So TypeScript was able to catch a type error there here in our normal JavaScript file. Now, as I said, this also enables some useful quick fixes. So I'm going to go onto this line. And it says, oh, it cannot find the current name. Did you mean add? And we probably did mean add. But if I put my cursor here, this little light bulb will show up. And if I click on this, I can do a quick fix that says change spelling to add. And then I've gone and quickly fixed that error. Now, as I mentioned, there are a few different ways of enabling Check.js in the uh, project that you're working in. One of them is to add a TS check comment at the top of every file. The second way, if you want to enable Check.js for all of your JavaScript files in your project. You can open the VS Code settings, which I'm going to do by pressing Control and then comma. That'd be Command comma on Mac. And I'm going to search JavaScript implicit. And I want the JavaScript implicit project config Check.js setting. Um, and this, when you enable it, will enable the semantic checking in any JavaScript file that is not part of its own JS config project. So let's just go turn this on. And if I go back here, get rid of this, let's go introduce another error again. And you can see that now it is also reporting errors, uh, even though I do not have the check.js comment at the top of the file. And I can go and do my quick fix again, of course. Now, the third way is to actually create a JavaScript project file or a JS config file. I'm going to do that just by going into the command palette. So Control Shift P, Command Shift P on Mac, and then saying, go to project configuration. So JavaScript, go to project configuration. And it will say, oh, there's not a current JavaScript project. Let's go create one. And in this JS config file, I have check.js turned on. So I'm going to save this. And in my workspace, now all of the JavaScript files are considered to be part of this JS config project. By setting this check.js true flag, the uh, files will also be type checked by TypeScript. And you can even run the TypeScript compiler against this JS config project to get these errors reported on the command line. Now, let's go open this other index file. There's one more cool thing that Check.js enables is auto import uh, error fixes or auto import quick fixes. So we can see here I have app and it's saying cannot find name app. And VS Code does have auto imports out of the box. But those auto imports typically only work in JavaScript files when you're actually typing out um, a, a suggestions and you're getting suggestions. In this case, though, we're just we have an undefined variable. You can see that when I put my cursor over it, we get the light bulb. And if I go and click the light bulb, I get a suggestion to add an auto import. Now, normally that is something that's only available in TypeScript files, 
But in this case, we are actually seeing this in JavaScript files as well. And as soon as I accept that, we go and we add the import. So that is the check.js setting. It's a great way to leverage some of the power of TypeScript when working in a JavaScript project. When you're creating a new file in VS Code, you can use a slash in the file name to put that new file inside of a specific folder. Let's go over here, and I'm going to go create a new file here. And I'm going to call this button and then slash index.ts. And when I actually create this, I'm going to say Enter. You'll see that VS Code has created a directory called button and then created a new file called index.ts inside of that directory. So I didn't have to use the create folder first and then create a file inside of there. I could just use the new file command. Now, of course, you can also get more complicated with this. So if I wanted to do something like a slash b slash c slash d.js, now VS Code will create all of these nested directories and put them inside of each other. VS Code will, by default, collapse down any um, directories that only have a single entry in them uh, in this case. So it's collapsing those. But if you actually check on disk, all of these folders are properly um, there. Now, if I do this for a folder that already exists, so I'm going to go focus here, and I'm going to use create new file, and let's say button slash d dot ts. Now we've gone and we've actually put this folder or this new file inside of an already existing uh, folder. So the new file command will create new directories as needed, um, but it can also be used to put a new file inside of a specific folder if you want to. Of course, this also works for the create new directory. So let's say I wanted to create a new directory called B inside a directory called A. I can just do A slash B, and now I've gone and created that directory structure. So hopefully that saves you a little bit of time when creating new files. You can use VS Code's source control view to stage or revert a subset of changes within a file. So here I have the source control view open, and say I wanted to view the changes in the code action menu file here. I'm just going to click on that and open up the changes. Now, by default, VS Code will render these in a inline view. So you can see that it is highlighting the original file and then the changed line right below that here. Now, if we wanted to view these in a slightly different way, I can actually open the command palette and say, compare toggle inline view. And if I run this, instead of using an inline view, VS Code will instead show the original file on the left and then the changed file on the right. It's still highlighting all the changes in the file, but it might be, a um, depending on how complex your changes are, you may prefer either using the inline view or the um, diff view where it's split between the two sides. Now, as I look through these, I can start seeing, hmm, this change looks a little suspicious here. Uh, so maybe I should revert that. And rather than just deleting this manually, I can actually just right click and then say revert selected ranges. And now VS Code has gotten rid of that change. Now, if I want to, to, let's say, oh, this looks like an interesting change here. So I want to commit this. Now I'm going to highlight this, and I can just run in the command palette, stage selected ranges. And it's looking at all the ranges that I've changed or that are within my selection, and now it has staged those to be committed. So that is basically me saying, I want that change to be included in my next commit. If I scroll up here, I can see, oh, here's where I changed the active actions name. Um, and I want to commit that, but I don't want to commit this next change yet. So I'm just going to right click on this, this one change, and then say stage selected ranges. And now I've just staged that one change within my file while keeping this other change. Um, it's changed on disk, but I haven't actually staged that for commit yet. So let's go back to the source control view. And now you can see I have a subset of changes within this file that are staged and some changes within this file that are not yet staged, but have been changed on disk. If I want to view the subset that have been staged, I can just click on the uh, entry in the staged uh, changes section. I can look through this and say, oh, that looks good, and commit it if I wanted to. Or I could actually go and right click on these and, for example, unstage these or revert them if I wanted to as well. So I have the option to move things back and forth between the staged um, area and the um, changed area. So once everything is looking good, then I can actually go and enter my commit, mes commit message. Doing this type of thing from the command line would be very difficult, but using VS Code source control view, it's really easy to stage a subset of the changes that you're working with, quickly review those, and make sure you're only checking in what you want to. Smart selection lets you quickly expand your current selection based on the structure of the program. In this TypeScript file, for example, I'm going to place my cursor inside this is preferred property, and then I'm going to use the expand selection command. So I can go to the selection menu here and say expand selection, 
or I can use the uh, keyboard shortcut. So Shift, Alt, and then right arrow. So let's use the keyboard shortcut for this instead. And I'm going to say Shift, Alt, right arrow. And you can see that first it selected the uh, camel case word here that I was in. And now it's selected the entire property name as I press the right arrow again. If I press the right arrow with Shift and Alt held down again, it'll select the entire dotted property axis here, then the entire negation, the entire if conditional, the entire if statement itself. Eventually, if I keep pressing the right arrow, the entire body of the function here, then the function signature itself, the, so the entire function, the body of the class that I'm in, so up here, and then the entire class itself. And you can also see the selection in the minimap being tracked. And if I press this one more time, now it's selected the entire file. Now, if I find that I've selected too much, I can always shrink my current selection. So I'll just press Shift, Alt, and then the left arrow to shrink my current selection and go back down here. Now, this also works for imports, for example. So I'm going to go to the import list here, and I'm going to start expanding my selection. So Shift, Alt, and then right arrow. First, it selects the camel case word, entire name, the entire import list. There we go, the entire line, the entire list of imports, and then the entire file again. So smart selection is intelligent, and it'll try to select the um, next larger element based on the structure of the program itself. So it's supported in JavaScript and TypeScript, but out of the box, VS Code also ships with support for smart selection in HTML. Let's take a look at that real quick. So I'm going to place my cursor inside this list element. And now I'm again going to use Shift, Alt, and then right arrow to expand my current selection. And now I can just start expanding it slowly. So now we've selected the entire um, contents of this unordered, unordered list, list itself. And eventually, I get up to the entire uh, program itself here. I find that smart selection is very helpful when doing refactorings or moving code about. You can also install language extensions to get smart selection support in additional languages. The split editor command lets you quickly open a second copy of the current editor. It's bound to control backslash on Windows, command backslash on Mac. So here I have editor.ts focused, and I'm going to use the split editor command here, so control backslash. And now I've opened a second copy of it just to the side of my existing editor. Now I can scroll through the second copy on its own and do things like open peaks and other things in there. Now it's important to note that even though I have two copies of this editor open, it is still the same file. So if I make a change here, you'll see that those changes are reflected in both copies of the editor. It is still the same text data, but um, I can have different views of that data. Now, the same also works in the terminal. So let's make the terminal a little bit larger here. And say that I wanted two terminals visible at the same time. I can use the split terminal command, which is also bound to control backslash on Windows, command backslash on Mac. I'm just going to say control backslash here. And now I've opened two terminals next to each other. If I want three, I can just do control backslash again. And now I have three terminals open. So I'm able to split my terminals. I'm able to split my editors and quickly change my layout and view different parts of the same file using the split editor and split terminal commands. VS Code includes a number of built-in refactorings for JavaScript and TypeScript that can help you safely change your code. The two that I find myself using most often are extract constant and extract function. Let's take a look at some of these refactorings in a simple JavaScript project. So here I have some JavaScript code, and you can see it's using React. And you can see this large expression here. You might want to extract this and give it a name or extract it so that we can reuse the value somewhere else in our program. So I'm just going to select this expression. And when I do that, this little light bulb appears over here. That is indicating that there are code actions available for my current selection. If I click on this light bulb, I see a list of available refactorings. So we have extract constant and extract function. Now I can also see these refactorings by right clicking with the selection and going to the refactor menu here, which is bound to control shift R. I get that same list of refactorings. The one at the top of the list is extract constant. So let's go run extract constant. And now VS Code is prompting me for a name for the new constant. I'm going to call this my time. And if we actually look at what has been changed here, a new constant has been inter introduced at the top of the function call with the value of the selection um, that we had before. So that entire expression is now the value, and it is now called my time. So that is extract constant. Let's undo that and take a look at extract function. So for extract function, there are actually two cases. And the difference between these two is where the function is being extracted to. The first option is saying we could extract the function into the current scope, so into the um, existing app function here, 
or we could extract the function into the module scope. And in this case, let's go extract it into the module scope so it's at the top level of the program. And again, it's asking for a name for the new function. I'm going to call this get my time. And now you can see that VS Code has created a new function at the top level of the file. It's also introduced a argument for this function because we were using the props scale value in that expression before. We need to pass along props to this function in order for things to work. So that's extract constant and extract function. They're really useful for reorganizing your code. And if you're working in classes, there's also an extract method function that you can use as well for refactoring. Now, one of the other refactorings that can save a lot of time is move to new file. So here, let me go save my current file. We have this multiply function here, and this probably shouldn't live in this current file. Um, now, if we wanted to manually move this to a new file, we'd have to go create the new file, copy and paste the code over, and then also add an import for the newly exported multiply function. But we can use refactorings to save us a lot of time there. I'm just going to place my cursor on the function name, and you can see the light bulb appears. I'll click on the light bulb, and here is the move to new file refactoring. So if I go and I select this, VS Code will automatically go and move that um, function to a new file called multiply, or mul.js, and it's also added the import here. So we added the import for this new file, and if I go to definition here, you can see it opens up this new mul.js file with our function moved over into that. So that's the move to new file refactoring. Now, while we're here, let's also look at one other kind of cool refactoring, which is converting the type of exports that are being used. So if I select the entire expression here, um, I can actually convert between default exports and named exports. Right now, we are using named exports in this file. So we're exporting a symbol called multiply. But let's say we wanted to be able to just import the default export for multiply and use that instead. I'm going to go to the light bulb and say, convert named export to default export. And now it's added the default keyword here. Um, but the bigger change is that back in app, it's actually converted the export type. So it's no longer import star as multiply or uh, import multiply from this multiply file. It's just using a default export. Now I can also convert in reverse. So I'm going to go and say convert default export to named export. And now it's converted back and also updated the reference there. So that's been a quick look at some of the available refactorings for JavaScript and TypeScript. There are a bunch of other ones available as well. For example, there's refactorings that convert between having a long list of parameters and taking a single object that has all of those parameter values as properties on it. There's ones for converting between code that is using dot then heavily on promises and using async await. Um, so if you're wanting to learn more about all these available refactorings, definitely check out the VS Code docs. Now, and finally, to wrap up these tips and tricks, we want to share a preview of a new feature that we've been working on that you can test today in VS Code Insiders called Setting Sync. And Setting Sync lets you synchronize your settings, extensions, and other things across multiple VS Code instances using either a Microsoft or GitHub account. So here I have a normal VS Code install, and I'm on VS Code Insiders in this case, uh, and I'm going to enable Setting Sync. So I'm going to do that by going down to the little profile icon down here and then saying turn preferences sync on. Now it's going to warn me that this is a preview feature, and I would go read the documentation, make sure I understand what I'm getting myself into in this case. But let's go turn this on. And now it's asking, what do I actually want to synchronize between my machines? So do I want settings synchronized? Yeah, that seems pretty good. Uh, keyboard shortcuts, uh, let's turn that off actually, since I'm working on both Mac and Windows for now. Um, user snippets, that sounds good. Extensions and UI state. Let's, yeah, let's synchronize all of those, except for keyboard shortcuts. And now I'm going to select the account I want to use for synchronizing things. And I've already signed in with GitHub here. But on my other machine, I'm actually using my Microsoft account. So I'm going to go sign in with my main Microsoft account now. Now, after signing in here, you can see what has happened is that VS Code has now synchronized my current instance uh, on Windows here to the instance that I had on Mac. It's installing some extensions in the background. Um, it has also changed my theme color to match what I had on Mac. Um, and you can see that the Docker extension and the LiveShare extension, which I did not have before, have now been installed. Now I can go back to my instance on Mac here, and you can see that indeed my color theme was Monokai here. And if I go and I change this to, let's just do like um, Visual Studio Lite, change the settings there. And as soon as we go back to the instance over here, and it syncs things, and I'll give it a moment here. Now, once the change has been picked up, it has gone and now synchronized the changes between the two machines here. 
So any settings that I add to the one machine will now be synchronized to the other. Any extensions I add will also be synchronized to the other machine as well. Now, as I mentioned, this is something that is still a preview feature. To use it, you need to be using VS Code Insiders and be aware that this is something we are still actively working on, so there might be bugs, but it's pretty stable so far, and we're hoping to roll it out more widely pretty soon. It really makes setting up a new machine a whole lot easier. We're pretty excited about it, and I think it's a good way to wrap up this tips and tricks presentation. Well, there you have it. Hopefully some of these tips and tricks have connected with you. So I've tried to cover a range of different things. So everything from search editors to setting sync, for example, and maybe some of these tips and tricks are new to you and maybe they'll even change your workflow a little bit. Now, as I mentioned, I've been posting daily tips and tricks on Twitter and YouTube. So if you're interested in learning more about VS Code and how to use it efficiently and be a little bit more productive while using it, definitely check out those channels. Um, and then of course the VS Code community is always online as well. So we're on GitHub, we're on Twitter, we're on Stack Overflow. So if you're wanting to learn more about VS Code or get involved in the development of VS Code, or even just file a bug report, definitely try reaching out on those channels. But I hope these tips and tricks have been helpful and stay tuned for more.